doing first and then it's going to be dr aniruddha and then dr shobhashachi uh, has uh, dr shobhashachi joined us here no dr aniruddha you uh, spoke with dr shobhashachi yeah i'll just talk to him again okay hey guys hi everybody hi everybody ready because we we yeah. should start we, yeah. we are right, right on time okay uh we're gonna run a video evo if you if you agree yes, yes. Mr. Shampas, can you hear us i mean he's uh, joined us but i don't know whether he can hear us so people are starting welcome everybody we're getting ready we have people from all over the world this is an amazing day so Everything is being set in now. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, uh, good evening. We are here today, Saturday, with a very special day. Uh, good morning, Ivo, Ishtiake. Good evening. How are you guys? Good morning. Been great. Good, good. Good, good. Good, good. Good, good. good morning, good. everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, we're waiting for uh, the people. Uh, but as always, we want to know where are you guys? Where are you from? Where are you watching this? So be part of this experience and tell us where are you guys from. As, as we said uh, a few minutes ago, today is a very special day because we have a great topic and great speakers. You cannot to miss it this because it's going to be great. Um, we want to invite you guys to the social media, be part of this ecosystem, the Thumb University system. Uh, we connect here in social media. We are on all the platforms and we want to invite you, especially here to Talmud University uh, YouTube channel. You will have all the videos here. It's our uh, library, media library. So you can watch and see all the videos whenever you want. So don't miss it also because it's very interesting. We are more than 5,000 users here so of uh, of Talmud university of course in um, instagram we have a very a huge community here so be part also of this we are friends talking us from uh well ishtiaki anwar dr hassan from nigeria dr ejiakor good morning welcome welcome everyone and today also we want to present this day. Ivo, you're ready for this. We are very happy. And this is a very special moment for us. Ivo, please tell us what, what is coming here. Uh, yes, we, we have been working so hard. Uh, we, we have been working hard for the last three years. In COVID era, I think we did a you know, a very good job and people started to know us all over the world. And on September 24, uh, that's gonna change because we're gonna take the next step, right? We're gonna take this virtual community and virtual, uh, we, we call it a campus into a hybrid campus. What we're gonna have is a physical campus, an on-site campus, and we're gonna start teaching not only uh, theory, but also hands-on procedures, but in a very interesting way. So guys, I recommend you on September 24 to give us a couple of minutes of your life to understand what we're going to have. This is not going to be only surgery, but it's going to be the entire journey of the patient. You're going to start learning, you know, how to communicate with the patient, how to be in the operating room, how to be even in the consult. We're going to have refractive surgery, we're gonna have cataract surgery, we're gonna have retina, 
we're going to have cornea, we're going to have strabismus. So we're going to have many, many different things. And also, and this is very important, we were talking with Dr. Werner, there's such an honor to have her here with us, is we're going to have a lot of research published and in, you know, research is going to be a very important part of this new hybrid blended education that we're going to launch on September 24th. Absolutely. It's a new way of learning, a new learn of teaching. So please be part also of, of this. And here, there's a short video. Let me share with you guys. It's in Spanish, but for sure you will understand. This is in Spanish, but it's just to understand the, you know, the, the campus we have. We're going to, we have an operating room. We have a refractive uh, suite. We have uh, an ophthalmologic consult. We're going to do a lot with artificial eyes. Uh, so stay tuned on September 24th because this is going to be a lot of fun and a lot of teaching. Well, guys, welcome everyone. We are very happy to have you all here. I'm going to stop sharing my, my screen and we are all set, ready to go on. It's so great to have you all here. Thank you so much. So, Ishtiake, Ivo, whenever you want to start this uh, session, it's all yours, guys. Yes, Ivo, I think it's time we can start. Yes, yes, sure. So, the first one is going to be Jaime Martinez from Bascom Palmer. He is an amazing colleague, amazing friend. <laughs> And, and an expert in how to publish. So Jaime, thank you for giving us again your time to be here with us. No, no, thank you. Thank you, Ivo. Thank you, Dr. Anwar. Can you, can you, can you see my screen? Perfect, everything perfect. Yeah, perfect, we can see it. All right, perfect. Uh, well, thank you very much for inviting me uh, again um, to give this talk. I think I love these webinars. I mean, these, uh, they're, they're amazing, you know, I wish, one little comment that I want to say is I wish I could have this earlier in my career, honestly, you know, because I, I would not be asking many people and many no's or many some yes <laughs> uh, in terms of research and for, you know, uh, advices in terms of career. So I think it's great. And, and well, the topic that I'm going to talk is about why do we need to publish? So as you know, there's many many scientists and, and doctors they have published from 1800s uh many many years you know you can look at PubMed. Uh, there's papers uh, earliest the earliest papers like in the 1800s but actually it was not you know until recently in 1992 where evidence-based medicine was emphasized emphasized in terms of like a gold standard for teaching for uh for, for the clinical practice, for take care of patients, and basically they call it a new paradigm. So in this interesting paper, they show how the way we thought in the past and now how we are thinking the future in ways of integrating the evidence-based medicine for every decision that we make in terms of uh, clinical care, um, et cetera. So this is a new paradigm. So I think this is why one of the re big reasons it's important to publish. And the way I think about it, you know, it's a long, it's a long way of everybody uh, who, who's an MD doctor knows it's a long career. You go from, you know, high school, college, then medical school, and then, you know, residency and et cetera. So I think the way I see it, a doctor that does research, it doesn't matter what type of research. It, it matters, it, it doesn't matter if it's basic science, doesn't matter if it's uh, 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 clinical or retrospective studies. I think it gives a big plus. Uh, everyone knows that it gives you a big plus. It also the MD plus, um, and it helps you for you know for uh, you know getting into residency, getting into fellowship, getting a job, or also. But the most important thing is sharing your knowledge to help others uh, to take care of the patients. So I think, <clears throat> sorry, I think it's important to start early in your career. Uh, because in this way you can try, you know, basic science. If you don't like basic science, I think you can go to, you know, uh, clinical trials or retrospective studies, etc. 
and that way you know what kind of research do you like and so you have by that you know by the later of the career you already know what you like and you have a good uh, amount of uh, a good cv so the question here is you know how important then, or how interested is medical students in research? And actually, this Australian paper they show that in 60% of the students, they're interested in research. Uh, about 15% they're not. But the question is, um, you know, how uh, are they really doing research? Is 60%? Um, it's interesting how you ask these students of how the difficulties or you know how they see the problems in terms of developing that uh, desire research. And this paper showed the it's a paper that asked like 1600 students, medical students, and they asked many questions. Uh, and they asked if they strongly disagree or agree uh, or strongly agree. And interestingly, they showed that most of them, they agree and they don't, they don't know, do not know how to get involved in research. Another, another question they answered is that it is if they find it difficult uh, they agree that they find it difficult to find mentors and projects and also the lack of time uh doing medical school so i think this is why important that medical directors and anyone who's you know behind medical students uh taking care of them to protect this time for research because it is really important for for you know the the medical care for for the patients to to do research so and then also one question is how important is research, you know, depending on the career or depending at what stage of your career or what specialty uh, are you going to? Um, uh, and also where, where are you practicing medicine as well? And this is this paper that showed in Australia, they asked about uh, 10,000 doctors. Uh, the question is how is it important for you to do research? And it's interesting that as you can see in this graph, uh, in blue and red, if you're early in your career, like let's say uh, residency or early consultant, they were interested in research, but then as the, as the time goes, they, they lose interest, you know, when they're faculty, you know, for many years. And also in rural areas, they lose this uh, interest uh, compared to areas where they're like city or, you know, like metropolitan areas. So, and also one thing that I want to mention about this paper, it, uh, you know, the medical students that they wanted to do research, uh, sorry, they want to go into specialties that are difficult to competitive, such as internal medicine compared to psychiatry or, or emergency medicine, you know, they, they, they needed more research to be able to get into these uh, residencies. Uh, so um, that's one other thing that changes. Uh, depending on what you want to do. So I like this paper because I like this phrase about why it's important to do research. And as you can see in the, on the little box there, it says a physician who wants to help his or her patients, it is the best manner uses the knowledge of all the physicians of the world. But a physician who cares about all the patients offers his or her knowledge of all, to all the physicians of the world. So I really like this phrase that really uh, shows how research um, and publication is important to take, to, to share knowledge. And the question here is, I'm asking, uh, it, I think it's important is, is it important to how many papers do you publish? And the answer is yes. This, there's a, this uh, interesting article, um, where they, they review many uh, articles and then many authors, and they show that uh, the, the, pay, the ones that published more, they have a strong correlation with how impact the papers are. So if you publish more, the, the, most of, one of those papers is gonna have a, back in, a good impact on like a number of citations, et cetera. So, in summary, like uh, on this paper is that the often the more you try, the higher probability to get, to have a hit, to get, the, to hit the target uh, and the higher probability to get a strong uh, paper to have more citations, basically. There's something that, you know, uh, 
that uh, help us to see to kind of uh, on an unbiased way to uh, to grade uh, scientists is the H index. I think the H index is a good H, it's a good index to know uh, you know how good a person how much like good papers has been published. Like you can look it up on Web of Science, Scopus, Google Scholar. Uh, this is an example of one of the, how it looks in Google Scholar, Steve Hawking. You know, he has a great H index for it and I 10 index. And if you have a good H index, you can copy this in your CV and they'll help you also for, you know, for your, uh, for your CV. One of the questions that medical students and, you know, uh, students, they ask me if it's important to do case report. Uh, you know, some of some some seniors they said, ah, you shouldn't do too many case reports. They're not valuable. You know, they don't. I think it is important. It is valuable. Uh, they lead to new research and advance. You know, give ideas for clinical practice. And you know, it may help someone else in other world to give an idea uh, for to expand. So, in conclusion, is I think it's important to start research early in your career. The amount of papers, I think it's, it's important. And uh, even small research like case series or case reports, they're, they're valuable. Thank you. And that's all I got. <laughs> Amazing job, Jaime, thank you so much. I think you, you talk about some uh, so important topics, right? About quantity or quality I would like to know the opinion about uh, Liliana about this, or Dr. Sengupta, what do you think about this uh, typical topic that we discuss? It's about uh, quantity or it's about quality in our papers. I, if I can start, I just wanted to make a comment about the quote that he had for the importance of a paper and the impact of a paper for clinicians, right? So for example, we deal with problems with intraocular lenses all the time. We receive uh, intraocular lenses explanted from all over the world. And we publish a lot about our analysis on this. And very frequently we receive calls from an ophthalmologist. Oh my God, I have this problem with this patient with this lens. I don't know what's happening. And, and I simply send to them one of our papers, maybe we already published on the subject. And suddenly the ophthalmologist is so happy that someone else had that problem and that problem had been investigated and maybe there is a way to prevent or there is a solution. So they are extremely useful and they can impact ophthalmologists everywhere in the world. So that is very important. The question about Quantity and quality, I mean, I want to highlight about the case reports and he said that they are so important. I do believe case reports are sometimes the most interesting things. And unfortunately, they do not count much for what is called the impact factor for the journal. So now there is a trend to send all case reports to companion journals. They are published online only. But it still, I think, is extremely important to publish them because they are very helpful. And as he mentioned, I mean, they may initiate some kind of research. So e extremely important. Very nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I, like I, I really think... Oh, go ahead. I just wanted to quickly come in and say, I mean, it was yeah. a great talk. And Thank I think, you, you know, the... So, I mean, you sort of laid it out where, you know, start as early as you can, train yourself well, find a great mentor. And, uh, you know, I think uh, that's, that's a great start. So I think, I mean, that was uh, a very nice highlight from your talk. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think it's not be afraid, you know, of asking, you know, there's, you're going to get many no's. I, I, for sure, you're going to get no's. How I many people, they get, you know, um, right. disappointed and they just, they lose hope, you know, like they, they ask two people and they say, oh, fine, I didn't find anyone. But believe me, there's someone who is going to grab your hand and is going to teach you, like, oh, he's going to give you a big, give you, get, get that big impact in your, in your career in the long term. So, um, and then in the terms of like uh, quantity and quality, you know, many seniors are say, ah, well, you, you shouldn't publish that. That's not important. I mean, you, if you, even if you get negative results, like for example, you thought you were going to get positive results, you got negative results in terms of like something is not statistical significant. 
well, it's good. I mean, it's, it's negative. Some I, I've seen some seniors are like, oh, you, you think that's not that medic? I don't know. That surgery does not cause dry eye. Let's say, well, that that's good. If you didn't cause dry eye. Publish it and don't be afraid of publishing negative results, not just the positive results. That's what I'm saying. Thank and you. for the quantity, as if you do more, if you try more to publish, to write, I mean, you get better at it for yeah. sure. Yeah, I agree. And can I Thank add you. one? And uh, as mentioned, uh, the quantity is very important as well for the simple reason, as you grow, you become better at it. You cannot go straight away and write a review article or a meta-analysis. So you start with smaller things, maybe case reports, go to essays, letter to editors. And as and when you grow more familiar with the system, then you can move on to the higher category of articles, case series, and then cohort studies and original articles, etc. So that is one very important aspect of research because initially it can be very, very demotivating, especially the uh, given, especially uh, the number of no's we get from the journals. So that it can be very demotivating in the beginning. So one has to be very perseverant. Uh, show a lot of perseverance with it. Yes. I, one thing I want to comment is, you know, most of my, my friends, you know, they're in rural areas or they're in areas that are not a big hospitals. They ask me like, you know, uh, how can I publish? And I think, you know, they can, they can, they have, they're good surgeons. There's good surgeons out there, like in the rural areas with their private practice, you know, they, I think they can publish their own case series for something, you know, like a, a technique they they change from that it was published because they they stopped as a as a paper show that doctors they're then in their own private practice or rural areas they don't publish they lose their interest so I I, I think it's possible to publish uh, even if you're like in your own private practice and you don't have these big database you know from 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 big hospitals. Thank you. Thank you, Jaime. Amazing, amazing talk as always. Okay, our next speaker will be Dr. Aniruda Agarwal. Thank you, Aniruda. Thanks for being here and welcome. Thank you so much for the kind invitation. So I'll just uh, go straight to my talk. Uh, are my slides visible? Yes. Thank you. So changing gears here, I will be talking about the basics of clinical research and how we can start with an idea and go on further with it. So the first thing that as a researcher you must understand is that the odds that you'll find your name in print is very low. It's not more than 7 to 20%. So you should not be discouraged at the very outset. How do you begin? So you begin by first organizing your data demographics, and actually the figures. And I will talk more about this in my presentation. The second step would be to draw preliminary conclusions and a working hypothesis, and then perform a preliminary literature review. Third step, and I think the most important step is the methods. You need to have a very good methodology and the technique of how you're going to analyze your data. Finally, you would like to write down your results and choose your representative cases. After you've done all this comes the discussion and the extensive literature review. The introduction and the other aspects come much later into your research paper. So I'll just go about elaborating this actual reverse process of publishing uh, in my next few slides. It is the idea which counts. And if you look at this, manuscript in 1986 in British Medical Journal. It's a very simple observation that have diuresis, which is just because of a 10 degree head tilt. So you must look at certain other branches of medicine and see what they're doing. And this is such a simple observation that led to a clinically relevant manuscript, which is published in the literature. To simplify, when you have a finding, you must find out its accuracy and novelty. And these two, you may not be able to do on your own alone, but you may require the help of your colleagues and teamwork. So the fundamental question really is, you must have a singular relevant aim of your study. And are your observations providing any answers to your question? That's the question here. 
look at this example here. This is one of the manuscripts that I published, and we had very simple observations on the OCT. Since vitreoretina is my area of interest, so I'm going to show this example here, where you have certain findings in the vitreous, and you have certain findings in the choroid. I realized that these simple findings can help you use your OCT in your clinical practice to differentiate between toxoplasmosis and viral retinitis. Now, they can be so confusing in your clinics, but just one simple non-invasive tool when you analyze it properly can be so useful. What mistake most of us do is we become journal focused. So we like to publish in big journals, big impact journals and retina and AJO ophthalmology. But typically as a beginner, you must understand that the researcher really focuses on the topic of interest, the article itself, and they seek quality information. The reader is going to find the article anyway, you know, by internet search and by PubMed and other, other mechanisms. So what you need to really focus is on your own research rather than going after a, a particular journal. Of course, certain aspects such as introduction, and other aspects need to be very crisp and concise. So I'm just going to show you uh, this one manuscript that I received for review. Just looking at this manuscript, you know, it's, it's uh, I'm sorry to say, but this is not a very good one. And it's rather a bad introduction because you have text and text and only text. And if you have a reviewer looking at this, they will not be able to go over all of this text and they will not be able to understand what you're really trying to convey. So you need to be crisp and concise, just like your idea with what you started. The methods form the core of research. And it's a very good idea when you're starting out to perform a study and starting out a research project, you need to spend as much time as possible with your idea, with colleagues, to see how best you can go about your data. And this is especially important in prospective studies. And prospective studies do take time, so it's important for you to understand that you have to give a time for each study to take shape and to develop the idea. So it doesn't happen overnight and you really need to work on it so that it nurtured. Once you have enough information, you will go ahead and identify your patients. But remember the methods have to be detailed, but not so detailed. For example, if you provide this to the reader, he will not be able to make sense. But your method should be just enough so that another person who's reading a manuscript can provide or perform the same experiment using the same methodology and prove or disprove your results. The results need to be organized and decluttered. So it's a very good idea to, of course, go ahead with your analysis in this manner as well, where you divide your manuscript or idea into subsections and use appropriate headings. One thing in the discussion that you need to pay attention is, unless you are a, you're a big, you know, biggie in the field, you need to avoid self citations and you need to recognize the important people in the field. And this is also important in starting out with research. So for example, if you're going ahead with research in retinal imaging, then you need to identify which are the individuals who are doing that. And you should look at their papers, look at their research, and probably derive ideas from there. One thing which is very important is to limit yourself. And this is my own manuscript and my own mistake that I made. And you can see my last statement, which I've canceled out, is that our results demonstrate the usefulness of detecting certain thing with OCTA, et cetera. Now, this is something that I did not do in my study. And it's important to know what you did not do. Recognize that and avoid that in the manuscript. And this is something that as a beginner is so important because probably as a beginner, you are starting out with case reports and you tend to be very enthusiastic and say, oh, this case is proving this particular hypothesis. But remember to limit yourself and stick to only the conclusions that your study is actually giving you. It's important to summarize your results wisely. You need to understand the scope of your investigation. For techniques such as OCT angiography, you should know that it is probably not going to give you much information on the deeper choroid. So like in my manuscript here, simply being very honest and saying that this is something that your manuscript does not evaluate will go down very well 
with the reviewer and with the reader than by making statements which you cannot support with your data. So you must understand the limits of your observation. You start out simple and you stay simple, crisp, and you stay to your point and limit yourself. One very practical tip is you have young researchers, fellows, students who are obsessed with formatting the manuscript. And of course, they go ahead with using fonts, titles, spacings, and everything else, which actually starts the manuscript. And instead of paying attention to the content, you know, I end up actually correcting the formatting and that takes away a lot of time. Remember, you need to be simple again and you need to start to use reference managers, which are really helpful and use optimum figure quality as required by the journal. Because if you're not doing this, this could be a simple reason for rejection by, a by an article or by a journal, which may be overwhelmed with articles. You need to have to avoid this plagiarism and be very careful with this because as a young researcher, you don't want your career to be sabotaged before it actually begins. The field of publishing requires you to avoid plagiarism, including self-plagiarism. And there are certain guidelines available with most universities of what should be your limit of plagiarism. And it's very important because authorship is a sensitive issue. So if you're starting out new, you need to be aware that your authors are equal, if not more, shareholders in your manuscript. Everyone has to approve your manuscript and you need to give credit to all involved. Because more than the manuscript, the authorship or the plagiarism can become a more important issue with your publishing. Where to publish again is not important. You must have a basic understanding of the journal and the scope. And this all information is available. And I would encourage you as a young researcher to get an app, get download table of contents of your journals, of your specialty, so that you know what's going on and what journal is likely to accept your manuscript. And with this, I, I would like to end. Uh, it's just in eight minutes, I've just tried to include as much as possible, but I'll be happy, very happy to take any questions. Thank you. Amazing, Anita, amazing. Great tips and tools for, for the students, for the young doctors. Amazing, I really love your, your talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Guys, uh, any comments about this uh, great talk that we just had? What do you think? If I may make one, uh, I really like the comment about targeting for specific journals. And I'm going to comment a little bit about that in my presentation. But it is so important that you look for the journal where your research can be published. Because many times at JCRS, for example, we receive great technique papers, for example, that would be great for a vitro retinal surgery, sur uh, surgery uh, journal, but they are not appropriate for the readership of the JCRS, so the papers end up being rejected just based on that. So people may get discouraged. So the targeted journal has to do with your subject of research. So it, it's very important to target that correctly. Absolutely. Well, I have, I have a comment. I think, I think you did a great job in summarizing. I, I really enjoy it because as, as a reviewer is, you know, all these medical students, they send you their drafts and you, everything you said is what I end up fixing, <laughs> honestly, like the introduction is so long and, and you know, also the, the, the limitations, you know, they're, they're not putting limitations on what they're really like, you know, they have to share. But one thing is also on the discussion, uh, I've seen a lot of mistakes in terms of discussion. What, what really means a discussion? Uh, sometimes they copy the results in the discussion, and I've seen that a lot. Uh, you know, they, they put like their numbers, re, re, copy paste, like on the discussion. And I think discussion is more in terms of comparing against other papers, comparing against other authors with the same, uh, uh, you know, uh, results or different results. and. And they, they, that's why what they, they, they also put a lot of information from introduction to the discussion. So they really have to organize uh, in a, it did a great job. Yeah. Thank you. Thank there, you. Was, there was just a quick question that, uh, can we send the same manuscript to several journals? Hmm? So 
at the same yeah. time no i think the journals would require you to have an exclusive submission and only when they reject or at least reach a decision only then you are really allowed to submit to another journal and i think this is something which is really important because you cannot have parallel submissions not even of a data subset unless you are very specific or explicit during the submission of the primary data set right thanks okay uh next speaker it's dr singupta dr singupta thank you so much for being here with us it's a, it's a honor yeah. thank you so much for having me and i'm just trying to share my slides and in full screen mode let me know if you can see it clearly perfect all right All right. Very good evening from India to everyone, and I'm sure you know all of you are in different parts of the world where I can see sunlight and early mornings also. So, and it's great to have a lot of uh, you here. And I think Anirudh has made my job very easy with his uh, very beautifully curated talk, where you know he has already talked about all these steps. I think you know uh, the way you analyze the paper and the plan that you have for analysis essentially is talking about uh, you know the basics of biostatistics. So I think you know even if you are not doing the statistics ourselves, I think it's very crucial that uh, you know all of us understand some basic terminologies. So in this in the next eight minutes, I'll try and take you through some of the, these basic terminologies. i think you know to begin with we are all talking about data not only in medicine you know but everybody is talking about data and analytics and you know that you know pretty much uh, everybody is trying and mining data in terms of you know people are talking about big data but you know let's understand that you know almost everything comes from statistics right so so statistics essentially is the science of uh, you know collecting data describing data analyzing data interpreting and drawing conclusions from data and then uh, you know predicting future events i think that is what you know all of us are essentially trying to do uh, so this is what the power of statistics is and you know it really helps us organize understand and make sense of all the data that that we have and uh, you know so data really means you know observations that come from an experiment or a research and a variable means you know each set of observations in the data set that is each column in your excel or whatever data you are trying to use to collect your data uh, you know each column is is a variable you know for example age gender you know bcva or ocd thickness or you know number of injections etc so all of these are examples of data so you know we really need to understand that data is essentially of two types it could be either a continuous variable or it could be a categorical variable which in turn could be binomial ordinal or multinomial i'll just give you quick examples of these but so what do you what do i really mean by continuous uh, variable you know in other words it's a quantitative variable it's a variable that can take on many different uh, values uh, you know you know in theory and can lie anywhere between the lowest and the highest point on the measurement scale right so and essentially it could be anywhere between 0 and infinity and all continuous variables have a unit to it for example age you know it's in years bcva it's in logmar units or you know in decimals so intraocular pressure is in millimeters of mercury central foveal thickness is in microns retinal nerve fiber layer thickness again is in microns so these are all examples of continuous variables uh you know this is what we've seen now we'll talk about categorical variables which are also called qualitative variables you know these are things which are grouped according to some common property or properties and the number of members of the group are basically recorded so a categorical variable can only have a limited number of values we'll see you know examples could be gender it's usually either male or female success you know you could define it as a yes or a no types of macular hole closures say for example could be type 1 or type 2 you know types of uh, new vascular membranes you know in the olden days we used to call it classic or occult now we call it type 1 2 and 3 and types of injections it could be avastin or lucentis or iv i'm just giving you some examples so, you know so this could be only three types say for a particular study and you know, types of injury could be either an open globe or a closed globe injury you know so these are only limited numbers they don't have any unit to them and they can be either binomial ordinal or multinomial where binomial means only two options ordinal means more than two options but in a particular order and multinomial means more than two options but in no particular order now you know once we have uh, talked about the type of variable then we go on to how to describe that particular variable so you know continuous variables are described in terms of measures of central tendency where you know mean is uh, the most commonly used central tendency a uh, median is the you know is the second most common uh, which is the central value of uh, you know of that variable if you arrange it from in an ascending or a descending order and it, then the third is mode which is not very commonly used and then the other is measures of spread you know so it could be either range or interquartile range or 
you know, variance is, you know, how much each value varies from the mean. And then you have standard deviation, which is square root of this variance. You know, so the rule basically is to uh, use one measure of central tendency along with one measure of spread. So it usually is mean is always presented with standard deviation. Median is always, I mean, usually is presented with interquartile range. And then range is presented as such, you know, say a minimum to a maximum value. Uh, you know, the best way to graphically represent a continuous variable is a box and whisker plot. I'll just quickly show you what this is. So this is the best way of showing a continuous variable where, you know, the central box shows the 50th percentile in the center, the 75th and the 25th percentile. And you know, just imagine you're showing intraocular pressure in a set of 100 patients. You know, so you would have, say, a median or 50th percentile of, say, 17 millimeters of mercury. You, the 25th and 75th could be, you know, between 13 and 20. And then you have an upper and lower bound, which is usually about the 10th and the 90th percentile and then you have you know values which are way beyond that so these are called as outliers so a uh, continuous variable is uh, represented by mean with standard deviation or median with interquartile range and range and, uh, and if there are outliers you should also uh, you know point them out then we come to categorical variables it's very easy to express so these are expressed in terms of percentages with proportions so you know simple examples are percentage of subjects with more than 15 letter gain in vision and if you think about it it's going to be a yes or a no right so it's did somebody gain more than 15 letters? It's either a yes or a no. So this is a categorical variable. Uh, the number of patients with mild, moderate, and severe NPDR in a study population, right? So this is again, uh, you know, in terms of percentages, again, percentage of males versus females in a study population. And, you know, it's best represented as a bar diagram. So this is an example of, uh, you know, uh, say, you know, patients who had enucleation over a period of 20 years in a particular institution in India. So, you know, this is very easy to show uh, in that retinoblastoma was the commonest, call, you know, indication for enucleation. So, this is how we represent variables. Continuous is in terms of means with standard deviations and categoricals are usually in terms of N and percentages and represented as bar diagrams. Once we have, uh, you know, the type of variable and we have described each variable, so let's remember so far we are only talking about one variable at a time, right? So we are uh, looking at what is the type and then we are describing each variable of, of your Excel sheet. Now, when we start talking about, you know, interplay between two or more variables, we start talking about analytics. So now we have two or more variables. So there are three basic forms. This is really to simplify it for all of you. Three basic forms are, you know, differences between variables, correlations, and then associations. We'll take quick examples of these. So how do you find differences between variables? So it's really based on the outcome variable. You look at whether it's a continuous or a categorical variable. If it's a continuous variable, and then it's normally distributed, then we don't have time to go into a lot of these distributions, but, you know, a statistician can tell you uh, whether it's normally distributed or not. And if it's normally distributed, use the student t-test. And if it's not, then you use the Wilcoxon rank sum test. If it's a categorical variable, you use the chi-square test. You know, this, this is just a quick example uh, where you base it on the outcome variable, you know. So let's say we are trying to find difference in the mean OCT thickness in eyes with diabetic macular edema treated with Evastin versus IVTA, right? So OCT thickness is the outcome variable here. It's a, it's in microns, right? So it's a continuous variable. So, uh, so the dependent or the outcome variable is OCT thickness. It's very easy. So the test to be used here is the student T test or the Wilcoxon rank sum test. What happens if there are more than two groups, right? So if you see at the bottom, I have added additionally. So if there are more than two groups, we use the ANOVA test. If it's you know normally distributed and just so that you don't get confused, I haven't put it up. But if it's not normally distributed, you, we use the kruskal valis test. And if in categorical variables, we just use the chi-square or the Fisher exact test, irrespective of the number of uh, groups that we are comparing. You know, so after differences, we look at correlations between variables. You know, so let's remember that correlations does not imply associate, you know, causation. So causality association will come to that later. But correlations simply say, you know, that uh, when one variable is dependent on the other, what is the direction of dependence? And it uh, is represented by Pearson's or Spearman's correlation coefficients. You know, so the coefficients vary from minus one to plus one, where you know closer to zero suggests that, that there is no correlation uh, in the variables are independent of each other. If it's closer to one, it suggests that if one is increasing, the other also is increasing. And uh, the third is if it's closer to minus one, then you, you know, if as one increases, the other actually decreases. So this is how it can be represented graphically uh, using a two-way scatter plot. And then you can use a, you know, a line to show actual uh, you know, directions of uh, correlations. After correlations, we look at association between variables. 
you know so association basically uh, you know can a particular the question here to ask is so when do you use uh, you know uh, regression is you know can a uh, or association is can a particular variable or set of variables predict the value of another variable you know so the commonest thing that we use almost every day is the srk formula or you know one of these uh, iol calculation formulas you know where uh, you know the iol power out is the uh, out you know is the dependent variable it's a continuous variable so the, you know this is an example of association where this formula predicts the iol power accurately based on the k value and the axial length right so essentially what we are talking about to find associations is that means regression so regression helps to determine the value of one variable when the value of another variable or variables is known right so this is the concept of adjust adjustment and confounders which we need to essentially understand is that when when many independent variables influence the value of a dependent variable which are the associations with a real and which ones are spurious you know that is what the regression analysis helps us uh, determine and uh, initially we do a univariate regression where one independent and one dependent variable is seen and then we do a multivariable regression where more than one independent and only one dependent variable is seen right so here we can uh, adjust so uh, you know what is the influence of say variable uh, say intraocular power calculation and what is the influence of axial length on uh, intraocular power calculations given all other you know given all other uh, parameters are kept constant so we can actually uh, adjust for con confounders when you're looking at regressions and you know these are the four common types of regressions which are used also again based on the outcome variable if it's a continuous variable so you know so that's now you realize why it's important to essentially understand whether a variable is a continuous or a categorical variable so if it's a continuous variable the regression analysis used is linear regression if it's a categorical we use the logistic regression we'll I'll quickly talk to you about that if it's a counts data you know lots of counts data is available nowadays you know say for example number of foot you know number of steps taken uh, you know that's where we use poisson regression and then survival data is uh, you know very commonly used in uh, you know for example uh, glaucoma studies use a lot of this the aret studies have used a lot of survival survival analysis where the regression type is the cox proportional hazards so you know logistic regression is the commonest form of regression that you will see in uh, published papers you know it is used when the outcome variable is categorical and binomial it is based on the theory of likelihood ratios and the outcome is in terms of odds ratios right so now it rings a bell because you know we hear odds ratios uh, almost every day if you start reading papers you know so this is different from uh, risk ratios so you know actually you can uh, yeah, try and look up about how to interpret odds ratios we don't have a lot of time to go into a lot of these details but you know this is uh, the possibly the most powerful type of regression that we have the basic rule for regression is that if there is any missing data you know then the whole row that is the entire observation regarding a patient is dropped from the analysis so uh, you know so you may have uh, say 300 patients in your study but if you don't have you know so you may have the entire data all variables recorded for only 50 patients so your regression actually is applicable only to 50 patients right so that's uh, something that we need to understand always check the n in the regression analysis that is it is based on how many uh patients in your whole data set is usually smaller than the sample size due to some missing data uh, i have a website which you can actually look at it's called sanduktal research academy where there are some courses on biostatistics and some other uh, you know forms of uh, you know things like manuscript writing and a lot of things that we are discussing today so the take home message essentially is you know de determine the type of each variable describe it well uh that is use descriptive statistics means and standard deviations and box and whisker plots etc then use the analytics that is try and find differences correlations and regressions and then you know write the results uh, texts uh, of the results tables and and graphs thank you very much i'm happy to take questions if, if there are any excellent presentation yeah. so analyzing all those things how do you uh, take a help of a statistician at which level so i think you know when you are uh, if it's a prospective study i think it makes sense to involve the statistician right from the beginning you know they can help you with uh, you know defining your outcome measure you know sometimes we just say oh this is what i'm going to measure but we don't define it really well you know i'll just give you a quick example is uh, you know say you're looking at number you know how how much vision improved after say an intravitreal therapy you could actually define it in terms of number of lines improved or you could just say you know 10 letter gain how many had 10 letter gain so that becomes a yes or a no 
you know so yes or no that is a categorical variable and entire analysis plan changes but if you are uh, you know analysis in terms of say two line improvement or three lines you know or so the number of lines improvement so that's in log mark so that becomes a continuous variable and the entire analysis plan changes so these are very subtle differences but you know it makes sense to involve a statistician right from the beginning they'll also help you with sample size calculations and you know a lot of, you know say excel sheet designing and uh, you know formulate the plan uh you know all of that but uh, if it's a retrospective study i think also uh, it's important to get the statistician in before you start entering your data into the excel sheet because you know sometimes you know simple rule is don't enter any alphabets in an excel sheet you know except for the top row where you say age gender etc there should be no alphabets because that is not readable in a statistical software package but then you know a lot of people write very long uh, you know sentences in the excel sheet but then you know that can't really be used so it makes a sense to get the statistician as early as uh, as possible right uh, so i think uh, i would invite uh, dr veena to share his screen yeah. we have got a lot of uh, questions to discuss uh, after the uh, presentation there are some questions to dr liliana and uh, for professor hanover is my screen visible and am i yeah. audible yeah visible and audible dr veena okay. uh first of all i like to thank everyone for having me here uh so a little bit word about publish and perish publish or perish i think this has been the euphorism for since the very beginning and uh, i think some way down the line it did cha got changed to publish and flourish but i think both these first two euphorisms carry some amount of selfishness uh, with them and uh, that's why lots of uh, you know uh, predatory journals have come up uh, and predatory sites have come up promising you to publish so the uh, one thing we should change very significantly is that we should publish with passion with the idea of spreading knowledge and not for the personal gains so with this i like to go to the my talk uh, which is uh, publishing a case report now as jamie mentioned in his first uh, uh, talk uh, it is very important whether it is actually of any value in today scenario so typically if we see the foothill of hierarchy the uh, the hierarchy uh, of the uh, clinical evidence the uh, case reports are placed at the base at the foot of the they, are, they present the lowest level of evidence which is termed anecdotal evidence and typically since they receive fewer citations than the research articles they are in the danger of being phased out as we discussed earlier and many paper, uh, many journals have actually started their sister journals to publish case reports so let's discuss why it is important to publish case reports the case reports present one of the oldest forms of medical reporting for example personal communications and a very important things like zika virus outbreak was first announced by a case report uh, the case report serves as primers leading to new discoveries so for example development of aids can lead to kaposi sarcoma in a young homosexual male was that give us idea that aids is one thing which is developing so case report again was the leading front at this moment propranolol for infantile capillary hemangiomas was first used in a case report and now it is the established treatment modalities and of course the case reports form the basic uh, pharma, part of the pharmacovigilance to for the adverse direct reaction the thalidomide tragedy we all know was first reported by a case report the ozodex anterior migration in a fec patient led to its in Uh, insertion into inlet so that so uh, basically they are very very important and they tell us about the new discoveries and adverse effects and most importantly they work as a platform for training in scientific writing and cr critical thinking which may be very very important for the beginners as i mentioned earlier so i would say rather than the lowest level of evidence they are the first line of evidence and that's why we must start with the case reports now regarding writing a case report is not very difficult and that's why we all start with case reports uh, usually it consists of three parts introduction case report itself and the discussion while in while in introduction we discuss about the background of the case to be reported followed by what that particular case adds to the present literature in the case report section we present the details of the case itself while in discussion we discuss about the relevant of the present case 
and uh, and compare it with the literature and then conclude it so that is very short summary about how we write a case report yes. now my function over here would be i would be telling you how and what are the functions of a case report and how to get these case reports out, out of our normal routine practice so what are the functions of a case report let's see at it first so it reports the unique or rare features of a disease or an unexpected association between the disease or the symptoms the case reports describe the mechanisms or the pathogenesis of the disease they can also lead to detection of new therapy which may be so convincing that rct may not be required uh, the case reports present the unexpected the outcome or the side effects of the drug or the treatment and they serve as very important part of the medical education now how to find a publishable case in your routine practice remember the first two things because they are rare it is very unlikely that we would know at the baseline whether the case is publishable or not and the last four parts we will only come to know once the disease course or the follow up is very important so to find a publishable case it is very important you must know that at the baseline you will very rarely know that this case is publishable and by the time you come to know that the case is publishable often we are too late and the case is not following up with us so to publish a case report it is very important it is a prerequisite that we have base, a baseline documentation now unless we have baseline documentation we will never be able to publish a case and for that you must keep uh, make a good rapport with the patient and patient must be kept traceable at all times and one must be able to do exhaustive literature search i'll give you some of the examples from my career which how i was able to extract few of these case reports each one of these is a short story in itself so i hope you'll bear with me so this is one of my earliest case reports so i was a resident we went to medicine wards for a referral for seeing a dengue patient so at that point the patient had bilateral ecchymosis and i took a photograph of this particular patient Uh, with the most prized possession i had at that time so i took uh, with a simple mobile phone took the photograph and when i came back and reviewed the literature there was no case report of bilateral ecchymosis with the dengue fever and we were able to publish it so while it was a very simple gadget you can use most of our high tech gadgets to capture some of the non captured uh, Uh, entities previously for example vitreous based avulsion we have all read about it but never we, we, we go in the literature there are all line diagrams not even a single photograph so with the help of optos we could capture it and once you can capture it very nicely it will be publishable as i said in photography it has no rules it is just a sport it is the result which counts no matter how it is achieved so this is a patient again very beautiful photographs rare condition benign fleck retina uh, all you need is a good photograph and once you have a good photograph you will be able to publish it so remember documentation is the backbone of publishing never hesitate in documentation all you would lose is some space on the hard disk so again a little story i was doing a diabetic vitrectomy over here at the end once the surgery was over i was trying to indent and we found these unusual cysts at the pars plana again we read them very commonly because they are very interior very less photographs are available in literature all i did was took a still from the video and we were able to publish it so this again highlights that all you need to do is a very good documentation and again you have to document timely and smartly a good picture on your left is likely to be get uh, published while on your right it will be very difficult to publish so again a little story here this patient who came to a my clinic what looked like a nodular keratopathy so when we worked up this patient we found that actually this patient had a contact lens bandage contact lens which had been placed 3 years earlier now if i would not have taken the photograph at the baseline this case would not have been got uh, would not have been published so again i am uh, emphasizing here the importance of documentation at the baseline so for publishing a case documentation is absolute must the case may not be a rare one but look for what is different in a given case 
and of course it may not be accepted by one journal don't let rejections demotivate and there are a lot of journals available now where you can send these patients now coming to the second part of the documentation that is follow up of the patient and we all know that novelty is a must for publication but we again know that inherent vast nature of the medicine makes your work relatively easy because no two cases behave similarly in the long run so all you need to do is uh, keep following the up these patient regularly and you will have certain of your cases which end up differently and then you will be able to publish them again a little example i was a resident back then this patient came up with a mass uh, what looked like a malignancy but a closer look uh, on this mass revealed something long uh, insects like thing uh, so we again made a video of this patient but we found that these patient are actually insects crawling inside the orbit so we took out uh, we found that these were maggots found some, from somewhere turpentine oil and we could extract around 50 of them subsequently we took a biopsy of this patient which revealed that there was a basal cell carcinoma the patient was referred to a ent department where the patient went underwent a flap so this whole process took us two to three years it is a it and then we published it it might appear as a simple case small case report but again the you have to linger on with these cases and uh, once you get a different result you will be able to publish them so again many different conditions would have different uh, outcomes and once you have different outcomes you will be able to publish them and as uh, jamie mentioned earlier uh, uh, complications are very very easily accepted and people hesitate to report them so you should not hesitate to report negative outcome if you get negative outcomes you must report them and in fact these are the uh, uh, papers who get the highest number of uh, citations later on so uh, to sum up the follow up from a deviation from routine provides opportunity for the publication but then again a good knowledge of the subject is useful because you must know what is actually happening in this patient and how it is different from the routine and for that literature search is very very important sometimes you get a relatively rare condition you may be able to report it but even in commonly found condition you might uh, do a literature research call the patient back and you have to find some different aspect of the patient and then you will be able to report them do not give up see again a small simple story this case i saw in my residency and found a weird kind of blood vessel going right right through the fovea now at that point of time i did not know what it was i kept on asking several people but did not find an answer until 2 years later when came up about a condition something known as congenital retinal macro vessel now this is a congenital abnormality rarely seen but once i was able to recognize it uh, i have seen around 15 till now around 6 of them have been published and if you search about this entity you will find that there are only 40 45 papers so 10% of the publications from are from our group which again tells you that you have to linger on with your cases and one may one day you will find the diagnosis you have to think out of the box again a very common condition so all i did was made a collage of the myelinated nerve fibers we see commonly in our practice and we could be featured on the cover of a journal you have to be brave a patient with choroidal hemangioma with a macular hole sitting atop had been denied surgery by several surgeons so i happened to come across this patient we did operate this patient and we got a good outcome and we were able to publish it so again you take a different road uh, any uh, any surgeon would usually do a two pronged approach in this particular patient where there is a macular hole and subretinal bleed we did it in a single uh, operated this patient in a single sitting got a good result and we were able to publish it at times you are simply lucky you get across a very rare dystrophy you, which has never been described in your country and then you will be able to publish it or you can come across a very rare association and you can uh, publish it in a very high impact journal and last but not the least remember the luck favors the well read once you know what is happening in a particular subject you will be able to publish it once you find unusual happenings 
So to summarize, a large number of the cases we see in our clinics are publishable. All you need is do a good doc documentation and follow up. A good knowledge of the subject is always handy and you have to think out of the box. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vinod. That was excellent thing and uh, some encouragement uh, for us. Uh, while I share my screen for uh, Dr. Liliana's presentation, I just want to ask that, uh, I think somebody else is sharing screen. I've stopped yeah. sharing. Okay. Uh, that uh, JCRS is, uh, has changed their And that they are not going to thank you very much for the opportunity to deliver this presentation we have a laboratory at yeah i'll just i'll just let play the dr liliana's presentation okay we have a laboratory at the Boranai Center, University of Utah, specialized in the analysis of IOLs and other implantable devices. And we have published a considerable number of articles in the peer reviewed literature on the subject. When we decide to perform research with the intention to publish the results, we have to carefully consider the research subject. Through different methods, for example, by reviewing the available literature regarding our specialty and also discussing with senior colleagues, we need to identify research gaps because good journals will favor publication of new and original ideas. Once the subject is selected, we have to very clearly define the research question or hypothesis. And according to this question, we will select the most appropriate investigative method. Basically, we will ask ourselves, what do I need to answer this question? Is it a survey, a clinical study, a laboratory experiment, or other method? It is very important to write a detailed study protocol delineating the study design, which will be very helpful later when we write the materials and methods section of the manuscript. It is important to get familiarized with the different types of study designs, which are basically divided into experimental or observational studies with different subtypes within these two categories. For the different types of study designs, there are published standards available, which are very useful in assisting us to consider all aspects that are fundamental to their appropriate execution and reporting. As an example, the consolidated standards of reporting trials or consort, which can be found in this site, have detailed descriptions, a checklist, in a flow chart shown here that will assist us to not forget any of the important aspects that we have to consider in the execution and reporting of clinical trials. Some of the important pitfalls in the reporting of clinical trials can be found in these areas. We have to define very precisely inclusion and exclusion criteria, define the treatment groups and describe how the treatments were allocated, for example, randomization or not. We have to consider if we have an appropriate control group and if the duration of the follow-up is appropriate. For example, if we are assessing posterior capsule pacification formation with a new IOL, a duration of three months is not going to be enough. The test and control groups have to be comparable at baseline, as of course we cannot compare apples to oranges. If there were dropouts when evaluating treatments, we have to describe the reasons and also any side effects and complications besides the main outcome measures. 
I will not go in details on the importance of appropriate statistical analysis, but I just would like to highlight that having a statistician involved in the planning of the study is very important. The statistician can assist with a sample size calculation, which is based on previous studies and will determine how many patients you need in each group to answer your question, and also assist in selecting the appropriate tests to be used. Journals require the inclusion of a statement in the manuscript describing at a minimum the tests used, how the data is presented, and the significance level. It would be advisable for you to get familiarized with some basic statistical concepts, such as normal distribution of the data, parametric and non-parametric tests, among others, and a statistician will help you navigate through all of these concepts. Then, once the research is done, how to write the manuscript? I'll describe here my personal preferences. Other authors have their own style, but I like to start by writing the materials and methods by using the study protocol. Then I write the results based on the data collection, and I really like to use figures, graphs, and tables as much as possible. Of course, we have to be careful to not duplicate in the text information that's already in the graphs and tables. Then I write the discussion, highlighting the significance of the results, comparing them with previous studies, explaining contradictory or surprising results. It's always a good idea to outline the limitations of the current study and suggest future work that could expand the knowledge in the area studied. The last paragraph of the discussion contains the conclusions. The JCRS also has a special section named what was known and what this paper adds, so we can know very fast what's new in the current study. The introduction contains background statements on the subject, and the last paragraph usually specifies the aim of the current study. The last part I write is the abstract. And the format depends on the targeted journal. For example, the abstract for a full-length paper for the JCRS has a maximum of 250 words. It's structured with six sections, purpose, setting, design, methods, results, and conclusions. The abstract for the ophthalmology journal has a maximum of 350 words, and it is structured with the seven sections shown here. We should not underestimate the importance of choosing an appropriate title for the manuscript, as this is going to aid in the discovery of the work online through search mechanisms such as PubMed. The title should be direct to the point, conveying the core message of the study. And do not forget that JCRS and other journals do not allow brand names in titles. It is also usually not appropriate to formulate your title as a question. The reference list is very important and we should present references in the format required by the journal. When using a reference to support a statement, we should always cite the original source. And it is important to know the concept of plagiarism, which is the representation of another author's language, thoughts, ideas, or expressions as one's own original work. As I became the U.S. Associate Editor for JCRS in June of this year, I would like to go over the submission process for this journal. You start by assessing the journal site, where you can find information on what are the topics published, the types of articles, and format required for each type. As an example, if your research subject is mostly related to vitro retinal surgery, the JCRS is not going to be the best targeted journal. These are the types of articles currently published by JCRS. For a review, you have to submit an outline in advance to be approved. Some article types are by invitation only. 
all case reports submitted as of September 1st of this year will be published in the online only journal companion to the JCRS if accepted. This online journal has separate editors and an application process to request PubMed indexing is ongoing. The JCRS requires some results to be reported in specific ways, and in the site you find instructions and resources on reporting of astigmatism, for example. You can also find in the site resources regarding translation and English editing. The journal requires authors to use standardized graphs and terms for reporting refractive surgery results. And the Excel tool for creating such graphs is available in this site, so you only have to add your data. There are complete tutorials for authors and also for reviewers. And I recommend that at some point you become involved with the journal as a reviewer, because this experience will help you to be a better author. Submissions are done online. You enter the journal site and create an account. Then you follow the instructions provided. Basically, you enter information on the type of paper, classification terms and keywords, authors and affiliations, as well as financial disclosures. You then be prompt to upload the files composed of text, figures, tables and videos, if appropriate, and all have to be in the format required by the journal. For example, there are some specific requirements related to the resolution of figures, etc. Once all files are uploaded, the system will generate a PDF file, which needs to be reviewed and approved by the corresponding author. The JCRS staff will review the submission, and if everything looks fine, they will assign it to one of the editors, who will review the submission and make an early decision. For example, the paper could be immediately rejected if the subject is considered not to be within the scope of the journal, or assign the paper to at least to reviewers. For the timeline, the staff and the editors may take a few days to review and assign the paper. The reviewers have up to five days to accept or decline the invitation, and if they accept it, they have 14 days to provide the review, but late reviews are not really uncommon. Therefore, considering all of this, the authors may receive feedback from the journal anywhere from a few days to four or more weeks. If the decision of the editor is to revise, revised submissions are due in three months. Otherwise, they will be treated as a new submission. Once accepted, the paper will be published online ahead of print, and final publication in print will happen in four to six months. Some important numbers for the journal this year are listed here. The average time between original submission and decision was 30.6 days as of the end of May. The average rejection rate was 77.3%. 1,351 manuscripts were submitted in 2019, but as of July of this year, we have already received 1,031 submissions. It's likely that due to the pandemic, ophthalmologists had more time to write papers. The most recent impact factor of the JCRS is 2.689. There are many resources available online regarding all of the steps described here, from selection of the research subject to manuscript publication. In 2005 and 2006, the JCRS also published a series of papers on ophthalmology and vision science research, focusing on writing and publishing papers. I hope you find the information presented here useful, and I wish you to have a great experience in research and publication. Thank you very much again for this opportunity. Yeah, uh, so thank you, uh, Liliana. That was an excellent uh, presentation. I just wanted to uh, follow up with uh, Dr. Vinox that, you know, why JCRS has uh, gone separately for case 
uh, reports any reason is giving more importance or what was the reason so um the case reports, as I mentioned before, I think I think these are one of the most interesting forms of publications because later they may lead to something else. And but what happened is that there is a lot of consideration about number of citations, and for each journal there is a lot of consideration about the impact factor. Therefore, to have a lot of uh, case reports published in the journal is not necessarily a good thing. But we like case reports, and that's why there is a trend. Many journals are doing that. I think the AGU already did that, and the JCRS now is having everything online. There is a totally separate online-only journal for the case reports, so they do not necessarily count for the impact factor. But a good thing is that the journal is trying to get the PubMed indexing. So at least if you publish a case report, you can find still the case report in the PubMed. Another thing is that the rejection rate was really high, you know. It is, 77. it is. Yeah. Unfortunately, what this means, and I feel really sorry about that, is once in a while, some papers are actually good, they end up being rejected. So, but there are so many submissions and uh, the, the journal has a specific format and size for each month. So we have to, unfortunately, make a selection. So for each submission, there are scores given by the reviewers, by the editors, and then we go with those that have the highest scores. But that really means that some papers are actually good papers. They end up being rejected. And I think it's a pity. Okay. And I think the rejection rate may be even higher now because of the pandemic. There are so many submissions. We have four editors. We, we work all the time. It's unbelievable. <laughs> Ileana, I, I didn't know that number, about almost 80% of rejection. Yeah, 77 point something. Yeah. And I think increased a little bit recently. <laughs> but it's really because of space issues versus number of submissions. The number of submissions is very impressive. So we get the papers, they have to be really within the scope of the journal. And in the past, for example, we would um, include some papers about cornea, but now we are really restricting those that can be related directly to refractive surgery. So, so some treatment in the cornea after refractive surgery, we have to make, unfortunately, those difficult decisions. So, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I would just uh, invite uh, Professor uh, Shantos Hanover. He is the editor of IJO. And uh, just before he starts, I want to ask that if a uh, uh, paper has been rejected, what is your recommendation? Go to the uh, you know lower index journal or what, Professor uh, Hanover? Well, I mean, uh, obviously you have to keep trying. You can't stop if you have uh, if you believe that you have good work. You can. You know, not necessarily a lower impact journal, but any journal that can publish your kind of work should be tried. And armed with the comments that a previous journal would have made, you know, the nice reviewer comments, you can make your uh, uh, contribution much better using those comments and probably try even a higher journal. It doesn't really matter. Okay. I think that's a great comment. I, this highlights the importance of having great reviewers Absolutely. because you can really make your paper better. And another thing I want to highlight, JCRS have no favors. So as board members since many years, I have a number of papers rejected. And my co-author is frequently Nick Mamelis, who was the editor before. So together we have many papers rejected. So there is no favors. When you're a trainee, you had, you're a prolific publisher, Liliana. I, I think you used to work with Suresh <laughs> Pandey. Oh, yes, worked. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So I think I saw you, I've seen your name with Suresh in a lot of publications with uh, Yes, Dr. because David. we did fellowship together with right. Dr. David right. Apple. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll be talking about uh, what happens after submission. These, this probably is common to most of the journals, but I'm going to talk about what happens in Indian Journal of Ophthalmology, which I think follows almost the same pattern as other journals do. The role of an editor of a scientific journal is towards everyone, authors, peer reviewers, readers, and public as a whole. And the editorial process leads to production and publication. So this is the simple workflow that we follow. When a manuscript is uh, submitted, 
it goes to a technical check and the person who tech, does technical check is an ophthalmologist that person screens the manuscript for technical accuracy in the sense that if a particular manuscript is formatted well or not if all the components of the manuscript that are required are included or not are the figures formatted well or not if it fails technical check and if sub components are missing and need to be reformatted it is sent back to the author for alteration this is to minimize the time that the reviewer would spend on scrutinizing the manuscript if it is already technically optimal then the reviewer would spend that much less time on the manuscript reviewing it and the review can go, go directly to the contents of the manuscript instead of bothering about the technicalities then it undergoes what is called a baseline scientific review these are young assistant editors of various sub specialities who would screen a manuscript for academic content so again we are reducing the number of articles that we send out to reviewers by having this two step process this happens very quickly because these are given about 48 hours deadline and this happens within 6 to 12 hours after the manuscript is submitted so within 3 or 4 days we would be ideally ready to send out the manuscript for peer review so before we send out the manuscript for peer review the editor reviews the comments of the baseline scientific review and if it is an appropriate manuscript manuscript is straight away rejected so within a week 7 to 10 days the author would get a response that a particular manuscript is rejected without peer review based on the baseline scientific review this happens to about 25 to 30% of manuscripts so only those manuscripts which stand the scrutiny in these two stages would be sent out for peer review this is how my uh, opening screen would look like it will tell me how many manuscripts are uh, current and in what stage of processing are these manuscripts ideally we would like to see zero everywhere except for new submissions and those under peer review so basically as i said uh, once the manuscript is screened out it is sent for peer reviewers and we have a policy that at least two uh, reviewers have to be in a who have expertise in that particular a uh, field of interest would be sent manuscripts for peer review reviewers do the review and submit their comments within the stipulated time which may be from 2 to 3 weeks once those comments are uh, submitted associate editor or the editor or the section editors review those comments and make a recommendation if a revision is required it is sent back to the authors for revision and the authors resubmit it and the manuscripts can be rejected based on the peer review at this stage so if a revision is required and it is submitted by the author sometimes it goes to peer reviewers for a re review if the peer reviewers have insisted that they need to re review or if it's a major revision it goes to the reviewers for a re review and then the uh, process of coming back to the uh, editor and acceptance of re rejection would happen so what is peer review peer review is the evaluation of work by one or more people of similar competence to the producers of the work that means that we don't try to match the level of competences here but the bank of peer reviewers that we have would include people at various levels of expertise basically if you have a manuscript you don't send to top notch reviewers so if you choose have to choose three reviewers all of them would not be at the highest level of competence we choose somebody from the middle level of competence somebody at the basic level of competence somebody at a higher level of competence for each of the manuscripts so that we have a 360 degree kind of a review for each manuscript this is a process of self regulation you know it is to maintain standards of quality improve performance and provide credibility it is an accepted process for any journal is peer review something that you need to be worried about well authors are very critical or scared of the peer review process because the comments that you ultimately receive sometimes can be demotivating so peer review should not be considered as something that is demotivating because it is nothing but an impartial assessment of your manuscript and critical review or constructive criticism so what are the core values of peer review fairness confidentiality impartiality and expert assessment security efficiency transparency and integrity these are the eight uh, qualities core values of a peer review well uh, we follow a system of double blinding in the sense that the reviewer will not know who the author is 
and authors will not know who the reviewer is but the editorial team would obviously know both of these so at the process of review itself there are very few chances that the reviewer may be ident able to identify the author unless by using some of the indirect clues the kind of work that is being done or the description of the uh, uh, services if it's a tertiary care center located in southern india doing something on ocular oncology there are only three or four centers so obviously they can deduce the author but it is not mentioned as such what do uh, peer reviewers do they try to assess a manuscript for the suitability for publication they try to assess whether it is credible or true publication is the other results likely to be reproducible is it important relevant has it been communicated effectively is there any novelty factor and is there any plagiarism they also if it is publishable try to improve upon the current manuscript basically on the interpretation of results reasoning presentation and provide constructive criticism so who are these peer reviews we have a journal reviewer database from which we generally draw these peer reviewers based on their past history suppose a peer reviewer has a very good kind of a track record in terms of time of delivery of reviews those are preferred and the quality of reviews are constantly assessed and those who constantly turn up good reviews are the ones which are favored we can also go by suggestions of the authors if you have a area of focus which is very rare suppose somebody is doing a study on genetics of a very rare disease it's very difficult to find peer reviewers so sometimes you have to go by the suggestions of authors you can go by suggestions of other reviewers and you sometimes have to ask the uh, advice of board members and you can even do a pubmed search for a particular field of interest and then derive reviewers from that database and editors own knowledge of the domain when you look for a peer reviewer this is not what you would like you know if you choose a peer reviewer that means that the final responsibility for turning out the review is with the peer reviewer he may be or she may be able to take help from his or her students and mentees etc but the final responsibility has to be assumed by the reviewer it is not to be passed on until it becomes irrelevant in the sense that even if a master student reviews a manuscript finally it has to go back in the loop and the person to whom the review was assigned has to be responsible for the comments made by his or her assistants and the peer reviewer has to complete generally this kind of a questionnaire that is available online has to be completed about various factors that have been assessed and in the referee's report which is a text report uh, they have to comment on all these aspects is the purpose clear and does it seem important is the work novel and original are the conclusions supported by the data this is something very important that need to comment upon are the results important are are there any ethical questions does the data seem really credible are the numbers generally not falling in place are there any flaws and mistakes found in analysis of the data should anything to be added or removed to the authors demonstrate knowledge of prior work in the field how might be the article improved and will the community find it useful so after having reviewed the reviewers comments there are generally three outcomes acceptance without modification is extremely rare it can happen to letters to editor or photo essays or ophthalmic images but for other manuscripts acceptance without modif modification is extremely rare Ecopia I believe was the only author where uh, generally you would get an article accepted without any modifications he has that kind of a track record he would turn out uh, perfect manuscripts so otherwise it's very rare generally it is revision about 30% of manuscripts are sent for revision major revision with re review is common major re review without re review or a minor revision so in igo about 30% of manuscript 20 to 30% are sent for revision major revision with review happens in about 12 to 15% of manuscripts major revision without re review happens in about 5 to 10% of manuscripts and minor revision in about 5% of manuscripts generally the first draft is quite weak so as the manuscript uh, goes through the process of peer review and revision 
manuscript becomes much stronger so when a manuscript goes for major or minor revision the author is supposed to carefully consider the reviewer's comment and rebut it or make changes so generally uh, the author is supposed to make three columns and in the first column the comment of the reviewer is mentioned and in the second column the comments by the author are mentioned and in the third column actually where exactly in the manuscript page and line numbers as the change has been made has to be mentioned so this is a very nice way of putting it across back to the reviewers as to what changes have been proposed and what is the comment of the author and where exactly have these changes been carried out if no changes are to be made then no change can be mentioned in the third column this is how the manuscript comes back with track changes and it goes back to the reviewer if it is to be re reviewed so and at the end of a peer review process this is what we expect if it's what is the original submission after everything that has been added it really becomes a very nice publication so rejection can be because of technical or scientific issues lack of novelty or originality conclusions not supporting data results are less important or not relevant to the area of interest of the journal results may be uninteresting there might be ethical questions and the presentation may be unclear generally when a manuscript is rejected then authors get disappointed and there is some kind of a criticism that goes around but that is not really true because you know gen generally the journals are not biased they not get they don't get biased by who the author is or who the reviewer is they go by a consensus there are two or three reviewers who review the manuscript and if two of them have made very good comments and one reviewer has made comments which are out of place then those are generally ignored and a section editor can uh, become a moderator or associate editor can become a moderator editor can himself re review the manuscript so should you appeal against a reject decision usually we don't appeal against a reject de uh, decision but occasionally if you feel that uh, you know your something important in your manuscript has been really missed or there are factual uh, errors in the way manuscript has been reviewed then you can appeal to the editor about a rejection this is from literature how frequently do editors encounter manuscript problem what are the most common problem the most common problem happens to be poorly written manuscript second most common is inadequate or inappropriate presentation Third is poor description of design or materials and methods. Rest of these problems are there, but not very common. And we always do a plagiarism check. You know, if references are excluded, then what is acceptable is fifteen to twenty percent. Highest for a review article may be about thirty percent. But if references are included, obviously it becomes more. So when we do this particular check online, we exclude references. and we check only the body of the manuscript and uh, if depending on the category of the manuscript we actually have to go back and look what phrases have been copied from a uh, previous publication and if it's a very cross definition or criteria for diagnosis of a disease well obviously that is not plagiarism as long as it has been referenced so you look at ethics ethical responsibilities are there for everyone editor has ethical responsibilities authors has ethical responsibilities even reviewers have ethical responsibilities and if there are ethical misconduct then penalties can be very severe finally at the end of it we go into project uh, production stage where there will be copy editing language check and copy editing and type setting after that the manuscript is uh, sent back to the author for proof correction once the author approves the proof it goes to the editor for final check and finally it is paginated and printed is the game over after that you know the game actually begins because you have to market your uh, publication because you are looking at impact factor just by having it listed on pubmed sometimes doesn't suffice people may not pick it up so you have to talk about it if it's a good work you go give lectures on it and social media is also making impact to a certain extent in drawing attention of uh, people who are in the same academic area of interest in recognizing your manuscript and reviewing it citation universes we have two web of science which has about 12000 publication and scopus which has a larger base of about 16500 what is uh, 
considered important is of course impact factor but then there are other ways of uh, go- gauging the importance of a manuscript currently what has come about is h index h index is available both for journals as well as individual authors and that is becoming quite prominent h and j index impact factor by thomson reuters started off in 1963 as liliana pointed out it's a very simple way of calculating a uh, journal's impact factor by the number of citations that had happened in the previous 2 years for total number of citable articles in the journal in the previous 2 years so once you have a good impact factor then people would want to submit manuscripts to your journal and if a particular author has a good h index then obviously they stand a higher chance of getting grants and uh, getting better uh, job probably so lot goes on behind a journal and these are some of the recent cover issues cover pages of uh, indian journal of ophthalmology so i'd be happy to take any questions if you have thank you so much great talk uh, professor hanover i think uh, there are uh, some questions that has already been <coughs> answered so one thing uh, that i want to ask that how do you become a reviewer can you ask for in a journal that i want to be a reviewer right there are actually online uh, submissions for uh, becoming review uh, review requests you know you can submit online and the editorial team would assess your field of expertise and they would very soon assign you uh, a manuscript for review because reviewers are always uh, in sh- you know we have a scarcity of reviewers and we would keep looking for good reviewers we actually send out mailers to members of all india ophthalmological society requesting them to become reviewers and we would give them a chance and look at how they review and if they fare good, well then we will continue uh, them as reviewers if the review is not adequate then you might want to try them a couple of times and drop them perfect so i want to uh, ask uh, dr haime that you know first question there was one one of the audience said that you know you send their paper uh, to a uh, journal and they will steal your uh, publication can it happen i uh, know i i mean it, 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 who who steal it? like the journal you mean that's what we're saying uh, yeah there, there was a question from the audience that you send a manuscript to a journal and some authors uh, sorry some editorial person can uh, you know print it on on their own name can it happen at all I, I don't I never seen this I never heard of it I don't I think they are protected you know these journals are they're protected their your information and you know you have to be careful what you're sending on an email <laughs> you know that's why they have this password and logins you know to be secure I, I don't I don't think this I never I don't know if anyone has experience of this happening to you uh stealing your information probably what he means is that reviewers can uh... you know they may have conflict of interest and they may delay or reject your uh, submission and publish their own work in that time that they have bought suppose somebody is doing uh, work in a similar area of interest you know they might delay it or uh, reject it uh-huh. and then get their own work published that's possible well yeah the reviewers are the ones it's got to have be careful with the re- which reviewers do you have i guess <laughs> Uh, i think there is that's why there is a option of uh, uh, delisting some of the reviewers for for your uh, review process uh, for review of your article you can say no to certain reviewers if you want that these reviewers should not review your article many journals so the author uh, the uh, before the editorial sends a manuscript to reviewers the author is uh, i mean um, told that we are sending this to this to reviewers No, 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 no. That is not how it is. When you submit your manuscript, you can actually Suggest. list out reviewers who do not want your manuscript to review. Because if you already okay. know that two other people are working in the same area and they're very competitive, because publication has become very competitive, and if you're dealing with a rare disease and a novel treatment, mm-hmm. then it is uh, sometimes difficult to get it published. If somebody who's working in the same area would happen to review a manuscript, so you can. exclude them as reviewers when you submit the manuscript itself okay i got it i think uh, the audience got the answer and there is a question uh, from dr ivan he said that um, the open access style is uh, getting 
most of the journals with high charges for the authors is scientific independence getting damaged with this new style of publishing liliana would you take that yeah so that is a very good question because we receive emails every day about new journals and they say, yeah, we, we have a very fast track of publication and it's going to be peer reviewed and basically you're going to pay a fee for the publication or something. So yeah, I usually put those emails in the trash directly because that that's really damaging, I think. So you have to be careful with this type of thing. So uh, another thing that, uh, you know, uh, as the Professor Hanover was showing, the first thing of cause of rejection is poor writing. How to develop this skill, you know, is there, yeah, Dr. Shen Gupta. Yeah, please. Yeah, I just wanted to come in very quickly and, you know, say that we need to differentiate, uh, you know, predatory journals from the open access gamut because, you know, open access, there are lots of very good open access journals which, uh, you know, are doing a very good uh, work like the BMC group or the PLOS One group who are, you know, who are really awesome. legitimate and, you know, putting out good good information out there. But then, you know, at least 70-80% uh, of that, like Liliana has already told us, uh, are predatory, right? So, uh, predatory. You know, that's good. Yes. Correct. No, so, I was absolutely so would... mentioning about the predatory type, really. Because, exactly. So, yeah, exactly. that's about it, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so yeah, I was just uh, to the point that, you know, that uh, uh, Professor Hannah was showing that uh, poor writing is the first cause of rejection. So how to, you know, how to get a good way of writing, any tutorial or, you know, the guidelines that the people can uh, find out how to write uh, properly. Yeah, Professor Hanover, can you just, uh, you know, uh, you know Tell the audience that what is the best way that people you know learn this is something art or you can uh... you should read a lot that point Vinod was making very emphatically the more you know more you read better you can write that's what I believe if you read a lot of articles published in very good journals you try to understand the style in which your work has to be represented that is very important there is a particular style there is a particular method that you have to follow what you have to write in introduction and what do you write in materials and methods and in results and discussion, there is absolutely a style to follow and that can be learned by reading very good work, which may be related to your area of uh, research. So that's what I would suggest. Of course, there are language editors who can, if you are not a native English speaker, that you might have language issues, which you can combine by using a language editor. Once you have written a first draft, you can always pass it through a good language editor professional language editor who would be able to polish it up for you. Language is currently not a barrier. It is the style that is important. Okay. Yeah, you, you can also ask, ask your friends, you know, that first, you know, they're any, even if they're not in the field of whatever you're writing on, they, there may be some friends that they're really first language uh, English or, you know, they can, you know, review it because sometimes these, um, uh you you know for these uh reviewers that they help you for the grammar and the proofreading they're really expensive sometimes <laughs> you know they're really expensive so yeah and i just and wanted I, to make a quick comment yeah, you know, you know, on. if you don't mind yeah i think uh the idea is the most important thing uh, if uh, your idea is good it's novel most of the reviewers, in fact, help you to improve your manuscript in terms of uh, writing and language. And uh, personally, I've gone through uh, all this. And in the be beginning, you have lots of problems. But most of the reviewers I came across were very, very kind. And most of them, they help you to improve your manuscript, provided the content is good. Yeah, Dr. Shen Gupta. Yes, so I just wanted to say that, you know, there are, you can go to the Equator Network, that's the equatornetwork.org, you know, so Liliana talked about the consort, you know, that's actually a, a 21 point checklist where you can, that helps you write uh, randomized controlled trials, you know, if you're writing a prospective study, that's the stroke checklist, if you're writing a retrospective study, it's the record checklist, if you're writing a case report, it's the care checklist, that's a 10 point checklist, right? so you write about two sentences, of each of these 21 non-negotiable points, right? So you really have like 42, 43 sentences. That's more than half the manuscript. So, you know, uh, so, you know, you will not miss uh, on some things which the journal is really looking for. And uh, 
I think using checklists is a very good way of starting uh, uh, starting up. And of course, you know, like Dr. Munawar has said, you once you read more, uh, and we know that also pointed out, you know, once you start reading more, you know, your language language starts getting refined, and you will get there. So I think we're at the nearly end of the uh, our session. Uh, one thing that one of the uh, audience asked that, do you discuss about the exclusion? You know, you have excluded some group in discussion. Do you discuss anything regarding those uh, cases? Dr. Liliana? So you mentioned about exclusion criteria, is that? Yeah, is say that for example, you yeah, have excluded, excluded that uh, diabetes I'm not going to take for this study. Do you yeah, discuss well, anything in, of uh, those patients? Anything? No, I mean you. Patients? You have to define your exclusion criteria. Once you define it very well, we know that they were excluded. So you don't need to go back necessarily there. You have other things to focus on, but the exclusion criteria has to be very have to be very well defined. And many times they are not. And then when you get to the discussion, you don't understand a little bit what's going on. They have to be very upfront, very well defined. So, okay, so the uh, one last comment from uh, all the uh, speakers and panelists, uh, Dr. Jaime, please. Oh, I think, you know, I, I just want to answer that question there, answering that I think it's important. It says, publishing another language have a less impact. I. I I don't know what you think about in terms of like impact factor. I think that's, you know, it, it was, a, I think, an old, like, everyone wants to publish in a high impact factor. But I think right now, these days, the most important thing is it's an article, a journal that it's related to your topic, right? That's what I'm thinking. Like, someone else will find it and cite it easier than rather guiding you know, uh, as a high impact factor. I don't know what you guys think, you know, like, you know, do you, you do you, when you're going to publish a paper, do you guide, you think about, oh, I'm going to publish it at the highest impact factor and go then to the lowest impact factor. Or you, I think it's more important now these days, you know, to publish in an, in an art, in a journal that people will find it and will cite it. I think that's the most important thing. I, I don't know what you guys think um, about this. Okay, thank you. Last uh, comments from Dr. Vinod. Yeah, I, I think uh, I wanted to make that point the Jamie uh, made in his first talk, you know. Uh, uh, as clinicians, all of us see lots of patients and we have impact on several people and their families. But it's a matter of generation with the, our generation and the patient generation gone. Nobody is going to remember the patient or the doctor. But once we publish, that is in the history forever. It is going to be there. And especially in, the, in this era of internet, it is very difficult to erase anything you put on uh, as a formal publication. So that is, I think, one reason we must, all of us should publish. And as I said earlier, we should publish with passion rather than publishing uh, for any of the aphorisms mentioned that we should publish or perish or publish and flourish. It should be a passion rather than just for any say uh, gains or losses. It's... Okay. Thank you, Dr. Vinat. Uh, last words, Dr. Shen Gupta. Yeah, I think it was a great, uh, you know, you uh, great session where you know so many different aspects of the publication process were covered right from you know why you should publish to how you should publish to you know what the editors think about it and you know how you can disseminate your work. So. Uh, you know, it's a really nice presentation. So, you know, in a nutshell, it is you know, start early and uh, like, uh, you know, Jaime has already said, find, try and find mentors. Somebody will pick your hand, keep trying, never give up like Vinod said, you know, plan well, like Anirudh said, and, uh, and execute well, like Lilian, Liliana has already, already told us. So I think it was very nice uh, presentation altogether. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Professor Liliana, Thank you. your final uh, comments. Yeah, I'm so happy with this session. Again, I mean, this is so different and it's so important. One final comment is about the language. It's like in the journal, for example, we may receive some papers with problems with the language, but if we still can understand what's going on, we send for review and the reviewers, uh, if they get interested, they definitely can help. 
But unfortunately, sometimes the, the language problems are so important that we really cannot follow. And then those papers, unfortunately, they will get rejected immediately. We, may, we are going to say the reason. Right. And another comment that I would like to make is about the importance of publication. Sometimes it's actually important for the career. So, for example, in the United States, as you know, there are different tracks in the university. And if you want to get promoted and you are, for example, in a tenure track, publication is something that is going to be accounted for it. So the committee that's going to give you the promotion is going to look how many papers you are going to publish every year. However, if you are in a clinical track, that is not so important. And when we have our board meetings of the JCRS, the European co uh, colleagues, they explain that the impact factor is actually very important. Because in Europe, when you have something like the tenure track and you get promotion, they usually go to your list of publication and for each publication they calculate the value of that publication based on the impact factor of the journal so in some aspects that's actually very important so absolutely we have to publish with passion but there are some specific areas where unfortunately that's a requirement so we cannot forget that <laughs> thank you sir uh, I would request Professor Hanover, you know, to have the final comment and wrap up this uh, nice program. I thank everyone, you know, uh, this was a very learning uh, thing for us. Professor Hanover, last comment thank from you. Sir. Thank you all for this great initiative. That's it. Everybody did a great job. I think it's very useful. The entire session put together would be extremely useful for somebody who wants to publish. Definitely. Thank you all. Thank so, you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. Oh, we need well, to take a photo. Day. Hold on. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, we need to take a photo. Yeah. Yeah. Just take a photo. Okay. I will be sending it bye. to all. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank bye bye. You.